cloud. And, and I'm gonna highlight here, I should oops, um, highlight me, I guess. Da, da, da. Okay. So now you should be able to see what I'm tying today. So the first one is we talked about these simple flies that have strange names. And this is a simple fly. It only has three materials. Four, if you include the thread, um, and it's called a no-brainer. Uh, the originator of the pat plat pattern is a fellow by the name of Wally Lutz, who lives in Edson in Alberta, and I've met Wally many times over the years. Very nice fellow. Uh, and this, for him, I think, was largely a grayling or a whitefish fly. Uh, but anyway, it's what they call a bomber style. It's basically just a general attractor. Uh, so the materials that we got are black dot thread, a uh, small piece of uh, wire. I don't know if you can see that. Small piece of wire. A uh, brown hackle. And a chunk of deer hair, or elk hair, I should say. So the uh, hook is just a size 10, 3x long wet fly hook, or smaller. You can do, do 14s anyway. And the trick is do it fairly simple. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start the thread right behind the eye and uh, get the thread attached to the hook. Ah, cut the thread right off the bat. Pardon me while I re do my bobbin. Again, for those of you who, who don't have a bobbin threader, what I use is these uh, very inexpensive dental floss threaders. And they work pretty well. So let's start that again. So get started. Now snip on top of the hook, please. And then I'm going to take my wire and I'm going to uh, Lay that onto the hook. And then I'm going to wrap down the shank of the hook. I'm going to wrap the wire and I'm going to keep the wire on the near side of the hook. And I'm going to wrap right back to where the point used to be before I bent it off. Then I'm going to move the wire so it's hanging straight down. Then I'm going to tie in the hackle, which is a, this is actually a, furnace uh, saddle hackle that came out of this guy here. You can use a, a neck hackle, but the neck hackles tend to be more tapered than what I want for this pattern. And I want this hackle to be a little bit undersized, just barely gap width. So I'm going to take the hackle and strip the stand bare, and I'm going to tie that in right where the thread is. And I'm gonna just leave a little bit of stem uh, between the hook and the start of the barbules and the hackle. Bind the stem down and I'm gonna trim that. And I'm going to do the same thing with this. I'm gonna bend the hackle down a bit so that it's kind of down and out of the way. I'm going to bring the thread up in behind. Let it hang. Then I got my elk hair. And I'm going to find some elk hair that's reasonably straight and has a, a reasonably nice markings at the tips. I'm going to take a, a chunk off. And at first, it'll look like it's an oversized chunk, but it's going to get thinned down. I'll cut it free. Get my lint catcher here and 
going to hold it by the tip, the very tips, and I'll pull all the loose stuff out from underneath. So that by the time I stripped all of the short hairs out and uh, held onto the tips, I've made that a lot smaller batch. I take a couple of the long ones that stick out. And then into my hair stacker, I'm going to whap it a few times to stack the ends up so the tips are even. And once again, I'm going to, there's some that are a little long, so I'm going to yarf those out. And then I'm going to take and I'm going to measure about, take those long black ones out. I'm going to measure about gap width behind where I've got the tying thread. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to wrap right over top of that. In behind where I've got the wire tied in and the hackle tied in. I get a couple of good wraps in there. Then I'm going to pull that up out of the way and I'm going to wrap my thread forward on the hook shank till I'm just about an eye width behind the eye of the hook. I'm going to take the puffy elk here and I'm going to put it, pull it down over top of the hook shank and kind of surround the hook with that but my wire got caught up in there. I don't want the wire in there with the, I don't want the wire in there with the hackle. Get that out of there, okay. There you go. So now I have the hackle and the wire sticking out to the side there. I'm gonna tie this down around the hook shank, right behind the eye of the hook. And I'm gonna do a couple of good wraps there. And I'm going to pull the loose hairs up at the front and I'm going to wrap in front of them so they stand up a bit. And I'm going to take and I'm going to trim them down short, probably a gap length above the hook. So there's the uh, wing, I should guess you could call it. Then I'm going to take my hackle and I'm going to wrap two wraps close together at the back. Then I'm going to spiral it up where the deer hair is. Nice even wraps, five or six wraps up the body of the fly and stop right behind the wing and bring my thread around behind the wing and tie the hackle off. And then one more wrap in front. Snip that down right tight. So far so good. Now I'm going to take the wire and I'm going to counter wrap that opposite direction. And I'm going to wiggle that wire between the barbules of the hackle so that I don't trap them down up against the deer hair. And as I do this, I'm going to cross over the stem of the hackle and take that right up in again in behind the wing couple of wraps over to secure the wire and pull back and two or three wraps there. And I'll get my cheap scissors down here and slide down the wire just to trim it off. Up in front of the wing again, just to stand it up. 
and we finish. So there we go. That is the no brainer. Any questions or comments? Could pass as a uh, caterpillar, right? Yeah, I guess it'd be a caterpillar. It could be, uh, I call it a floating stick. <laughs> and, and sometimes uh, if you got a brook or a stream right beside, you know, the forest yep. goes right over top, it falls in the water. They could feed I on. Think, I think it's the, uh, the bushy hackle that goes right up the body that creates a lot of surface. <laughs> it's on the water if you tied that in a in a size 12 uh and made it a little fatter it would work as a traveling sedge too i would think that's the no-brainer fairly straightforward so the next one is is uh also a very simple pattern i'm gonna go highlight this again spotlight again So this one is called the usual. And it has only two materials. It has pink thread and the other material is one of these guys a rabbit foot. Now I've already been digging at this rabbit foot. So I, I most of the hair, you don't want the hair on the sides. You want the hair that's underneath the very bottom, right, right in here in the middle, which is water repellent. It makes it float. And so I've created a little notch here where I can get in here with my scissors and get at that stuff. The hook is pretty straightforward. It is a standard size 10 Mustad dry fly hook. Uh, and I just have to kill the barb. Put that in there. Let me just tighten my vice up here. There we go. And I get my pink thread. Now, this isn't the pinkest thread I have. I have some really pink thread, but this is a little on the thick side for this size of fly. So I'm gonna use the slightly less brilliant pink, but it's it's still pink. Um, and I'm going to start right behind the hook again. And I'm going to do a, a few wraps, maybe a quarter of the way down the hook. And then trim that. This time I'm going to trim it off on the top so it doesn't fall off on the floor. Stack right the way here. Then the, the fun part begins is, is getting the fur out of the foot of the rabbit and i want the the first one i want the little longer stuff that's that's sort of back here so i'm going to grab a pinch of that get in here with my scissors and i'm going to go right down to the the bottom of the fur right down at the bottom and i'm going to snip off a chunk You see that's fairly fuzzy. 
what I'm going to do with this now is I'm going to strip the fuzz out of the bottom and set that aside. All the little fuzzy bits from the short fuzzy bits from the bottom. You can see now I've got a, a bit of the longer fibers by the tip. Pull this fuzz out again to reduce the bulk of fuzz at the bottom here. And turn them around and holding on to the, the tips. I'm going to set that down onto the hook shank and I want that fuzzy to be one about one and a half shank lengths long and the thread's going to be maybe an eye width behind the eye. And I'm just going to do a pinch wrap over to cinch that down on top of the hook. I'm going to take my thread back on the butts of this rabbit fur that uh, will now crush down onto the hook shank because I've taken most of the bulk of the fluff out. Bring my thread back up, wrap in front to stand that up a little bit. And then I'm going to wrap my thread right back down the shank of the hook, right down to where the barb of the hook used to be. And I'm going to go in here again with my scissors. And I'm going to take a slightly smaller pinch of hair off of this thing now. So deep, get in here with my scissors and sort of just snip a little smaller batch out. Again, not as fluffy as the first one. And I'm going to grab just the tips again with my hand. And I'm going to pull that loose fuzzy stuff out. Again, not getting rid of it, but setting it aside. And I'm going to set that down on the hook shank so that the, the hairs stick out behind the hook just about gap length again. Pinch wrap on top and then bind that hair down on the shank of the hook. Now you see what I got now is I've got a tail of fuzzy rabbit fur and I've got a shank that is covered by thread. Now what I want to do here is I'm going to do lots of wraps up the shank of the hook in order to build a little bit of a base for putting the body material on. Even this whole shank out in the middle of the tube. Maybe a little taper there so that it's a little fatter at the front than at the back. And then come back to the back of the hook, back where the rear batch is. And I take all of this fuzzy fur that I took out from, from underneath. And this is all the soft stuff. It doesn't have any of that long fibers in it. It's a little bit of it there. I'm going to take the fuzzy stuff and use a little bit of dubbing wax on the thread to make it a little tacky. And then I'm going to take the fuzziest stuff that I can find and I'm going to spin that onto the thread. I'm going to try to keep that reasonably compact. Now where it's not even, I'm going to fill in with a little bit of buzz. Trying to make a relatively even little rope of furry fuzz dubbing on a thread. Not too, not too bulky. When I get there, I'm going to slide that up the thread until I get it to the shank. And then I'm going to start wrapping that fuzzy body up forward on the hook shank. And trying to even it out as much as I can. 
I still have a little bit left over. And again, using as much of the short fuzzy fibers as I can, none of the long stuff. And wrap that up right in behind that wing. And then I'm gonna make a really thin little rope here just as I get to where the wing is. I'm gonna pull the wing back. I'm gonna do a couple of wraps in front just to make that wing stand up. And then I'm going to pull the wing back, two or three shred wraps and a whip finish. I do a double one here because I don't want to stick any glue in there and I want the whip finish to hold up. And I'm just gonna, some of that stuff is sticking out a bit on the side. So I'm just gonna trim it a little bit on the body to make it a little more svelte. And that's pretty much it. I don't wanna make it too tidy. There we go. And that is the usual. As in, what are you using today? Oh, the usual. There you go. Live crowd here today, Dave. Yeah, see that. <laughs> so so it, it just shows that you can make a pretty darn and this is basically you know we tied a whole a little while back we tied a whole bunch of those uh uh snowshoe hair emergers which is basically what this is this is a snowshoe hair foot uh so it's basically a snowshoe hair emerger but the body is all, all the same material so it's very simple and from what i understand it works pretty well i haven't fished this one much myself but I have read a bit about it, and uh, apparently it, it's uh, Fran Betters is the innovator who tied it up first, and uh, she's pretty well known as a very effective fly tire. So, there you go. The usual. How small do you tie those, Dave? I, th I think you could tie, this is a 10, you could probably tie it to maybe a 16. If you have, if you do tie a 16, you're going to have to take all of this fuzzy stuff in the middle. You're going to have to chop it up a little bit to make that, uh, that body dubbing material a little finer. And just use very little, a, a lot less of the spiky hair for the wing and the tail. But I think you could tie it fairly small. I wouldn't go smaller than 16, that's for sure. 14 might be the best, 12 and 14, 10, 12 and 14. It's an emerger pattern, so a mayfly emerger. So it lies just below the surface? Just on the surface, it sits oh. right on the surface. Because that deer hair, that, sorry, that, uh, that uh, rabbit fur is water repellent. So it sits right in on the surface. It's not going to sink very far. That, that's the point between using the snowshoe hair foot and using the stuff that's in the dead center of it, because that's those are the fibers that have whatever the natural oils in and the natural structure that uh, makes this stuff really float well and is water repellent. Otherwise, you know, the old snowshoe hair would get ice balls in his foot as he was walking across the snow and he wouldn't be able to run so fast. So they obviously have something in this hair that uh, doesn't let them stick to the snow. I guess you've got to keep that in a package. Stop it drying out. Though. Yeah, yeah, I do. I keep that in a snowshoe rabbit. You can get them in different colors too. This is a clean color. But for the, the snowshoe hair emerges I did before, this color is a pretty effective color. 
it works well. There you go. So simple patterns with different same, different names. <laughs> so we got uh, Mr. Dave is going to do us a couple of patterns now, and he did yeah, a good. But the patterns are going to do is like sometimes you get to a lake or a stream or a river and you see people catching fish, but not you. <laughs> anyway, sometimes it is about cower, sometimes it is about the shape of the fly, but this, this particular pattern, there's no restrictions on the materials and there's no restrictions on the body. Like you could have a dub, you can have wool, you can have any, type of material on the body. So it's only restricted by your imagination when it comes to the uh, fly itself. Basically you use a streamer hook. Uh, for the purpose of this exercise, I'll use a large one then a small one to show you some differences. Um, I mentioned last week, um, back east you weren't allowed to use anything um, to make the fly sink like lead or, or beads or anything. Um, when you're fishing um, but if you have a hard time tying a decent head on a fly or tying um, so that your eye is still usable at the end of your fly um, I would suggest a bead. Uh, the beads um, are very inexpensive. Eh, where are we here? 275 for 96 beads and plus you get 10% off on the bead shop right beside Robinson's. I talked to a lady so she'll get just say you're with golden rods and reels and she'll give you 10% off. Um, so I I'll use two different colored beads and I'll talk about the body shape and the color. Um, I really like this particular type of thread. It's a six odd thread. Um, it's a maroon in color for the particular, so it doesn't take away from the uh, red bead. But for the purpose of uh, this fly, I always like to have a tail on it. If you look back at uh, Atlantic salmon flies, in the 80s, they came out with putting fluorescent tails on them. Sometimes they're fluorescent green, sometimes they're fluorescent orange, sometimes they're fluorescent red. And for people that can't make up their mind, sometimes they're green and red. Anyways, for this, particular fly I'll use red and it's more it's more of a, a neon flossy material rather than a thread and you don't need a lot of it Oops. and it doesn't I'm using uh, a bobbin that didn't have any ceramic, obviously. Anyways, so really you want just a little bit of a tail. And people always tell you to do up and down on the fly so your material doesn't twist on the hook. It's now, I happen to be in Robinson's and I splurged. Now there's two different materials I've been using for these flies. One is a mohair, uh, where are we? Over here, mohair. And the other one is a particular called uh, a straggle. Right. And it's, it's really nice. It almost has legs on it. I really like that material, but don't fall over. I don't know if you can see the price of it. It's seven, eight bucks. So you, you want to use that sparingly. And uh, you could follow a um, couple procedures to minimize that. But I happen to know that when I measure this material out, my base of material is exactly what I need for this fly. When you tie flies, there's always a lot of advantages to doing at least a dozen flies. Um, Now, when you're tying a fly, 
you often don't know the conditions of wherever you're going to be fishing. Now, if you go to the same lake every time, you pretty well mastered that. But say you want to have in your fly box uh, uh, enough material uh, flies that no matter where you go, you're going to catch fish. Um, so what I usually do is I may not vary how many different types of flies I'll have, but I certainly will vary the materials on the same type of fly. Like this particular fly, I might tie over a dozen different ways with different materials and they look somewhat alike. Well, they're certainly tied alike, but they don't seem to, they seem to make a difference in catching fish. So, you know, your water clarity, um, a lot of the lakes around here have a lot of um, growth in it. So you end up getting algae. So you don't, after a period of time, it's not really clear. So the, the fluorescent butt's a good idea. Um, so wherever you fish makes a big difference on um, the fly you tie. Now this is mohair, so you can brush it out. Now, another material that's kind of uh, not well used around here that I've heard of is a calf tail. Now, um, they come in all different colors, whatever color you want. I mean, this is only a small sample of my inventory, but um, this particular one is um, natural color. Um, this one I really like that you can tell there's not much left to it. <laughs> Anyways, it comes in different, usually on the same tail, comes with different, two different colors, a darker color and a lighter color. So like Dave, I kind of get rid of all the loose fibers. And after a while you do it enough, um, you kind of get it down. You, you don't mind a couple, stragglers but you know fairly neat one of the biggest problem people have is they put too much material on a fly anyways i don't um, i know that the fish around here are short hitters so i tend to cut the fly off a little short of the the end of the hook so if you look at that it's it's allowing the fish to come in and they've already been exposed to the hook now i usually do five turns And another thing people do is they crowd the front of the hook. And so they get a whole bulk of head up here because they haven't allowed kind of a gap right there to, uh, for all the material you, you put on. Um, normally people kind of just leave that one hair as it is, but I'm kind of a fussy guy. And I like variations. And again, I don't see too much of that around here. And so what I'd like to do is repeat the process, only put the sort of like another a topping on this of a darker color. And, and on the hairs, on these calf tails, they usually come like a, a lighter color and a darker color. This one is excellent. It had white on the top, which is almost completely gone and the darker fur on the bottom. And what happens, I use a little darker to create a contrast and I will shorten that considerably so that it's not going back as far as the last one. So you got a layering effect. I, know, I hope you can see that on your video there. Now, some people, I knew I was going to tie a um, hackle in, but what happens is you can, this doesn't really need a hackle. I, I always found that I caught more fish with hackles, hence I tie hackles on my fly. But you could take that up and tie that neatly up there so that it didn't, but I left the space for the hackle. Now for hackle, in my humidity controlled uh, um, facility, I got this hackle out from storage which I think I bought in 1965. <laughs> As you can tell, it's an ample shape. I won't be using that one today because it's too dry. But anyways, um, from Tolgan's, they have this nice variegated um, 
feathers that I got from a saddle hackle that match the colors. So I'll be using that today. How did you prepare your hackle, Dave? Did you uh, tie in at the stem end? Yes, it did. The, the root of the feather. Um, uh, all my little hackle players are now losing their grip. I need some replacements. If I only had three tools, so it would be a pair of scissors, a hackle pliers, and a bobbin threader. Now with your hackle pliers, you can, you can do what I do is you, you take a, a piece of heat shrink tubing and put them on the jaws and heat shrink that little piece of tubing on and they will, that will improve their grip. So because I used a, um, again, because I used the bead, I don't need to use any varnish. People, you know, um, I mean, the type of varnish you use that's good, has a lacquer in it and it's very strong. But if you look at the body of this fly, you got what I said, the fluorescent butt that the, the fish sees and then the layering effect. And so it presents a decent fly and it works well in the water. Any questions on that particular fly? Should get them all names so, so I can get my name in the book someplace. But anyways, um, I really find the layering effect to be quite good. So you got up front, it's quite dark and at the back, it's quite light. So you have a transition period there. Are you fishing it in the lake? I've done really well with this particular fly. Um, remember back about a month ago when everybody was using the um, Tom Thumb, I used this fly and did quite well with it. Um, didn't go, I didn't go too fast on that one. No. Okay. Um, this one is a standard, that one was a four times hook. This is a standard one time Togan size eight hook. And I want to show you, geez, I got a bumblebee here or, or a hornet. Ugh. He likes my thread. Okay. Bear with me for a second. There I can, I can mount them <laughs> and use them for an exhibit. Okay. So I use, okay. Um, for this one, I am gonna use the straggle thread just to show you. Now that was a mohair. And again, um, I know I'm gonna use an orange bead on this one. So there's all kinds of options. For the tail I've used uh, for us, I'll show you some flies at the end so you get a better idea. But I used, um, for the butts, di different fluorescent materials, depending on what I was trying to achieve. And sometimes um, if you're fishing, you know, if you're fishing a lake, you go around the lake with, and you have fish finder and you're seeing that there's fish on, on the fish finder, but you're not having any, any luck. They may not be feeding, but they may not be feeding on your particular fly. It might be the cover. So I make the same fly in a number of different colors. Now this particular color is a burnt orange. Now, if you go down to Robinson's or any place and you look at burnt orange or whatever color it is and look on the rack, you'll find that the color, it depends on when they were made, the colors are all 
<laughs> they do change with the uh, production line. Now this straggle thread is very interesting. Um, it was the first time I used it was this year. Materials being developed every day. So fly tires today used to, um, <laughs> they have a great advantage over fly, fly tires of yesterday. When I ordered that hackle in the 60s, Fred was considered, what color black would you like? This uh, straggle string is a product that uh, made by an outfit called Semperfly. Yeah, and if you if you hear me, I'm using my thumbnails to drag out all the fibers. I don't know if you can hear that. Yep. So I'm trying to. You spent the money. You also make those fibers work for you. And here again, I'm going to leave a little space at the end. So I don't want to bunch up everything at the front. Now, the last fly I made was four times. This is one time. Um, I'll make this one on with deer hair, just to change it up a bit. Here's the hide of a 1980 deer that I would harvest it, that that's all that's left of it. <laughs> um, one thing though, the difference between cap tail and deer tail or deer body, the deer body floats mm -hmm. much better than the cap tail. So if you're making a wet fly, I prefer the cap tail over the deer hair, but there's times when the deer hair fly because of its segmentation, and that's the same, I, if I had a choice between caribou, moose, or deer hair, I'd go for moose, caribou, and then deer. But deer is a lot more inexpensive and easy to attain. Again, like Dave says, you pick up a piece, you sort through it, you fluff it. And I think, oh, that's way too much for what I'm going to do. So I'll make sure I get all the long ones out. it on. And if you can see deer hair kind of fluffs out like that when you put pressure on it. Now sometimes if if I'm fishing a river where the stream is really fast, I know I'm going to put a hackle on this, but I also know that if I push these hairs back and only trim some of them, when I put the hackle on, the hackle won't go flush. It will be stopped by these hairs. So if, if I think some of the pictures I sent out, you'll see that I've left a few hairs. And the reason I left a few of those hairs standing up is so when the hackle gets the water pressure on it, it, will, it won't fold right back completely like it would with the calf hair. So different materials have, you should watch them in the water to see, you know, just call them near your boat or near you in the water so that you see what you're getting in, you're getting as a final product. Um, what I noticed that uh, in particular, there's a magazine called Spawner and it's a Newfoundland magazine. Um, and it's, it's a true magazine. Um, glossy pictures, and it has Atlantic salmon flies. And it will show you all the flies and Newfoundlanders will change one um, material and call it something they named, right? <laughs> so you'll see a whole bunch of flies that are very similar. And um, now at this point, because it's deer hair, I would use bear on top of it rather than some bear. Just happen to have some bear hair. <laughs> ah.
This particular bear was a nuisance bear. <laughs> Aren't they all? <laughs> Well, he had figured, my aunt had a garage that had a sensor. She, she, um, her husband passed away very young. This, this, this is bare hair going on top. Again, to give that layered look, but you want to have materials that go together. I wouldn't use the calf tail and the deer hair. Um, so the bare hair is a very um, fine product. Would you use mousse there on top, like dark yes. hair? Yes. Yeah. I prefer mousse. Um, I, I'm saving my mousse for when I go back east. I'm going to tie up some flies. So, I uh, bear and mousse. Um, I, I like the action of um, the bear in the water as a wet fly, but the mousse has the distinctive. Um, coloring similar to deer hair, only more distinctive. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll use another hackle. Um, you don't want to use your best hackles for wet flies, but you want them to, you know, be a, a fresh hackle because if you start using dry dote hackles, they don't last very long. Just trying to find one the right size. There we go. Now, another thing about tying flies is everybody has their own pressure, how tight they tie the thread on, on the hook. And, you know, some people break thread continuously. It's, it's only by practice you learn your own strength in tying thread. Um, another thing, if you put too much pressure, you bend your hook and ruin the hook. The floor and you got that tying down now. And there you go. So I left the bear on this particular one longer than shorter because I want the bear hair has a tendency to go flatter. And, and um, that's what I wanted on this particular. So your different materials, you'll change different things. Here is the same fly tied with all kinds of different. Now this is a regular sledge fly. Oops, sledge fly. This is the one I tied just a couple minutes ago. Um, if Fisher being fussy, here, here's a red body, short, sh cut short, and it also doesn't have a bead on it. Um, so just to show you how variant these can be, it's your choice of materials and your choice of colors. Here's a white one, blackhead, and it's got some uh, flashaboo in it. So oh, you're only restricted by your imagination when you tie those flies. Any questions? Uh, Thanks. It, it, it's um, kind of um, interesting to see a very different style of tying, you know, in a way it's, I don't know if it's your background with Atlantic salmon flies or something. It's, uh, I, I, I can see that this is sort of different from all the sort of standard Western flies that I've been trying to learn over the last little while. So thank you. Yeah, um, I mentioned my father used to give me two flies and I learned to uh, tie flies because I would go through uh, the two flies quite readily. 
So if I was there for the weekend, I needed to have more than two flies. So I learned to tie on a picnic bench. And um, sometimes I didn't even have a vice. It was a, it was a wine bottle with the, the cork. But um, what I used to do is spend a lot of time watching the water. And that's what I highly recommend. You know, um, there's a, quite a variance in water colors. Um, the volume of water passing by and the speed of the water, uh, whether you're fishing a brook or a river or whatever, um, I'm fished a lot of big rivers with lots of volume of water where, you know, the river could be really fast in the spring and really slow, almost like a dead calm. I've also fished um, still waters and um, beaver ponds. So, you know, quite a variety. And most of the time I spent watching because ironically, um, my father and I would fish quite a bit and we would row once around the fish, um, the still water or the beaver pond and see how many fish my father would catch. And then I would go around and he was a wet fly fisherman. And I was a dry fly fisherman and we would tease each other. And I used to teach, tease my dad about, ah, you don't really catch those fish. I said, they set the hooks themselves. You got to try dry fly you know, where you have to set the hook. Anyways, we used to teach, tease each other, but we used to read the water. And that's why I often tie the same fly in so many different variations of color mm. and materials. Um, you don't have to tie complicated flies to catch fish. As, as we just showed with the patterns today, because they're fairly simple. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, use, use your beads. I mean, they, they make it sink. I mean, if you want to use a tons of bead and you're trolling, um, instead of being like a two or three inches below the water, you can be a, a foot below the water if you're using, you know, just even a tons and bead. And then you have your sinking lines. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many different materials that you can use today, you know, that just weren't available when I first started tying. Yeah, that straggle string, uh, I've seen that at Robinson's. They're, they're, they sell it at Bow Bro River Trout Fitters as well. Yeah, this is any cheaper? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't haven't bought any there. Um, if, the other guy you, I've seen that, that offers the Semperfly yeah, stuff yeah, is Gary really Hankey. He's a fellow by the name of Gary Hankey out of Edmonton, and he runs an outfit called East Slope Distributors. And I don't know whether what he sells online, I, but I was just looking it up. Um, and he's a big proponent of, of uh, Semperfly materials. Well, he sells the stuff, obviously. I would guess, yeah, yeah. Uh, but my, my way to, to deal with um, expensive stuff like that is just tied off straight off the, the, the spool. Yeah. And if you have I, a spool keeper, that helps. Ever yeah. since you started tying flies, I'd be very conscious about wastage. And I, did, I didn't have any wastage, you noticed? <laughs> yeah. Like, but it's all kind of like, pay attention to what you're doing. So I use the vise itself and the base as a measuring tool. And I do know that when you tie this particular fly, how far I need on the base. The first one I probably used too much, but not the second one. And it's just a matter of, you know, looking down and there's all kinds of notches and things on your flight, your different points and your, you know, you just go like, oh yeah, okay, that's good for a number six, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's practice and just kind of knowing your hooks. But I, when you get out here, you have to really show me how to make a couple. <laughs> I'm uh, thinking I should probably make a batch and, and put Put them in a box together with some flies and go yeah. to the post office and send you guys some yeah, yeah. stuff yeah. Hey, hey well 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 i remember uh if you've got some really long bear hair you know long single strands they make a great body on a carry special you <laughs> tie the tie them in by the tip twist them up with your hackle pliers and wind the body down on the carry special 
Yeah, it's, you know, it's very it's very tough stuff. You yeah, it is. These are these are these are flies you 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 repair. So because the the bear the bear stays on and you just put a fresh hackle. Yep. <laughs> By the um, way, I'm <coughs> sorry. Um, I was at Lee Valley yesterday, and if anyone's interested, they're clearing out in their section they have at the back where they're clearing out. They have these really neat stackable um, box, you know, with compartments that you can adjust them. But they're really nice because the things that adjust have a flat bottom. So if you're storing books or whatever, they don't sort of flow over to the other one. And they can also stack in five of them for 11 bucks. Yeah, they're really a pretty good deal. Yeah, I think I have a stack of those boxes from a few years ago, also probably from Lee Valley. But they're really nice because they nest. They have a, a bump on the bottom, so they nest. They don't slide all over the place. Mm. Yeah, the for for hooks though, the the only box that I found to be uh, hook proof are. Uh, not even those. The only ones that are I found to be absolutely hook proof, even in size 2022, are those. Um, they're effectively they're pill boxes because they have seven compartments, but they're sold oh. by the crafts in. They're sold in the craft store, and they have that spring latch on one side. Mm. You know <coughs> the boxes I'm talking about where you. You press a little pin and then you can lift the lid on one compartment. Right. Mm -hmm. Those things are the only things I found that hooks are not gonna fly out of. And I'm talking about small hooks. If you if you're talking like you know, saltwater hooks and stuff like that, these Lee Valley boxes are perfect. And so are the you know, the fly boxes. That's Please. a Myran fly box, right? That's I, these Miran ones um, for hooks, what you have to do is you have to put a little layer of foam in the lid to keep them from ah, okay. from one compartment to the other. Yeah, that 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 will do. Yeah, so that's what I use for my hooks. And they're out of they're out of Lee Valley, and they're they're quite reasonable and they're economically space sa savers. I think mm. they're clearing those out as well, Bill. Pardon? I think they had those in the clearance section as well. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually heading down there today now that you've said something. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you, you know can never I, have too many of those boxes. What I end up doing quite often is I just run a little bead of super glue along the bottom of, of the divider. Yeah. Oh, so, so you, you, you fix it in place. Yeah. yeah. And then there's no way they can escape. And they can, yeah, can't, can't go from compartment to compartment. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, uh, I, I have to run here at some point. Uh, I have to go down. I have to go down to uh, West Tech to pick up a couple of pieces for a little bit of my irrigation system that got busted yesterday. <laughs> and they close it, close at uh, noon. Um, for guys. next week. Do we want to? You've got something in mind for next week, do you, uh, Florin? Well, I'm I'm on a I'm on a dry fly uh, trajectory right now, so <laughs> I could do. I was I was working a variety of um, of parachutes with those biot bodies mm -hmm. that I was. So I did a bunch of. Um, I did a bunch of drakes first in sizes 10 and 12. And then I, uh, I was doing some blueing olives in 16s. Then I switched to some PMDs in size 14. Um, I could do one of those to just kind of show what a biot bodied fly may look like. Um, okay. Or I could do an RS squad if it's been a while since we did that. Yeah. Or, um, I could I could do two of those if I just if I just demonstrate part of it and not the whole thing. And I think I might try this guy. It's a Stillwater nymph, Marabou peacock curl, saddle hacker, copper wire, and some lemon duck, lemon wood duck fibers. Yeah, the, the other one. Uh, 
think that would be nice to do sometime is because it's very easy to do this way. It's the um, the royal coachman in a parachute. Yeah. Version, you know, where you don't have to mess with dividing wings and all that. The other, the other version of the Royal Coachman that I found works really well is the Trude style, where the white wing goes at an angle off the yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. So that's a kind of a almost almost a CFF. Yes. Except for the red band in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we'll give it some thought as to <coughs> get idea as to what we might do next week. Yeah. So, in the uh, meantime, I'm going to have to run, so I'm going to have to end the meeting here. I better stop the recording. Anyway, too. Dave, if you uh, want, I could, um, I have a, a couple little, take me two minutes, four minutes to tie, um, pink yeah. salmon flies. It's season's coming up. Yeah. Anyways, if you need a filler. My, my... Uh, those look interesting because if we do, we could do each fly. Oh, Amazing how many fish you can catch with that little fly. Yeah, and that that would be that would be also interesting for me because these things are, as far as I'm concerned, strangely exotic creatures. So I don't I don't mind learning some of these tricks. It's amazing how. You look at the fly and you think, oh, geez, no, nothing would ever take that. But pinks, like pink flies, like, you know, little simple pink fly like this catches fish. Like blue ones, too. Yeah, blue is my favorite. But it depends on whether you're in fresh water, in salt water, or brackish water, right? Yeah. Last year, Campbell, we were, we were having. Uh, Great time with uh, the blue ones. Same thing as that, but it was blue. Yeah, that's my pink fly case. I just take that up to Campbell River and uh, Cluck Suey and off we go. Oh boy, I was chasing after pink materials. Now I have to go looking for blue. Well, this yeah. Absolutely, fly blue's good. Caught over a hundred pinks. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I'm okay, happy. well, I have to run because yeah. I need I need a bite of lunch and then uh, back to the uh, salt mines. I want to see the afternoon game too. <laughs> yeah, I, it's uh, something wonky is going wrong on my iPad here. I can't get in here and end. <laughs> Anyways, right, have so, a good have bro. a good day and thank yeah. you very much. All right, we'll see you, on Tuesday. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Thanks Pretty a lot, fun. guys. Great flies well, well, today. Christ Christopher had a haircut. <laughs> yeah. Are you going out tomorrow? Or sorry, it's Monday? I'm going to try. I have to check. Everybody's out at the moment. Yeah. To see what the schedule is, but uh, our washer's gone on the blink now. Oh, no. <laughs> and what it is, is there isn't enough water coming in. And there's a gauge that you can change. Uh, you yeah. can move it, but I, it's got, it's a stackable. Yep. And I can't. It's hard lift, to move. Yeah. Yeah. I can't lift a dryer. So, you know. Check, the, um, no, uh, the thing, check the obvious stuff that the, the, uh, the hoses aren't uh, correct. Yeah, no, that's all done. But yeah. um, my daughter looked it up and says the number one problem with these machines was water. And yeah. we all agree. And so it's on the top of the dryer and the dryer has a, I mean, the washer and the dryer is sitting on top of the washer. So. Yeah. Is it, <laughs> are they Samsung lift. also? What? Are they saying, is it a Samsung washer and dryer? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Get the same guy that you got for the fridge. Probably knows what it is too. Anyways, we called, he didn't even go. come back and his answering service is, uh, Full. Yeah. Yeah. He must Never. be a Sam Hill, Sam yeah. Sam guy. <laughs> Anyways, I'll give you a call later about Monday. Okay. Right. Bye. Okay. So, Michael.